They have given us a new location. It will be upstairs in the library. So uh, the elevators are on the right when you walk in there. So uh, find one and go to the second floor and you'll see where the library is. So we'll, we'll be in there from now on or until they tell us to go somewhere else. All right. Three weeks ago, several of you asked what the word was on one of the sermon questions. It related to the pearl of great price. And we were stressing the value of the kingdom. Its teachings cannot be changed. Its teachings cannot be altered due to whatever is popular with the world. For example, the current craze is to have a rock band uh, to play religious songs. There are no rock bands in the New Testament. Everyone is supposed to sing. The same thing is true of choruses or singing groups. That was not the design of worship by God. His design is for all of us to sing when we gather together to honor him. So the point was the church cannot give in to current trends or compromise on any teachings. And compromise is what we plan to speak on today from the text regarding John the baptizer. In studying the life of Christ from Matthew, we have uh, come a long way in the last year. We have discussed fairly thoroughly the Sermon on the Mount, and in particular the Beatitudes. We have talked about the miracles of Christ in chapters 8 and 9. We've discussed the parables most recently uh, that end at the end of chapter 13. Now we're up to Matthew 14, and we want to see what happened to the great man who is described here, who refused to compromise. So, beginning with Matthew 14, 1 and 2, uh, we want to notice how the life of John, who baptized people, how his life came to an end. First of all, we're going to be dealing with Herod the Tetrarch, and uh, that's a term basically that refers to him ruling over one-fourth of the kingdom left by his father, Herod the Great. He is called Herod the Tetrarch or Herod Antipas or just Herod in this text. There were several Herods, and so that's why we distinguish him from some of the others. When his father, Herod the Great, died, his kingdom was split into four parts. And there are three brothers and one other person that inherited the four parts of the kingdom. There is Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch. And there is also Archelaus, his brother, and another brother, Philip, not to mention a half-brother named Philip. So we'll try to keep all of these straight. Archelaus received Judea and Samaria. That was his part of uh, the kingdom. Oh, there we are, Philip the Tetrarch and the other half-brother. All right, Archelaus received Judea and Samaria. That was his part of Herod the Great's kingdom. However, he fell into disfavor and was banished. His fourth was put in the hands of governors called procurators, of which Pontius Pilate was the sixth one. And uh, so that's how... Pontius Pilate in, enters the picture. He's uh, got a fourth of the kingdom, not because he was a brother, but because these procurators were put in charge. Another brother named Philip 
was given Bashan, and uh, that's the part between the green and the yellow on the map. It's not labeled, but that's where Bashan is. And then there was Herod, Herod the Tetrarch, Herod Antipas. He received Galilee and Perea. So this is how the kingdom of Herod the Great then was divided up. Now this Herod, Herod Antipas or Herod the Tetrarch, was given and uh, had given the order to execute John. And when he heard of Jesus working miracles, he concluded that John had risen from the dead and uh, that therefore he was at work and he was able to work all these miracles that he had been hearing about. Of course, we know that John and Jesus were two different men, but apparently Herod didn't know that. And so his conclusion about Jesus was false. But what led to that conclusion, besides a guilty conscience for having slain a righteous man? Well, as we discuss Herod, let's point out one positive thing. There aren't many. But one positive thing is that you could give him credit for one thing. And that is that he believed that the dead could be raised by the power of God. Now he was erroneous in his conclusion concerning that, but at least he believed that resurrection was possible by the power of God. So why did he think Jesus was the former John the baptizer? First of all, they were about the same age. Second, they were preaching the same message. Both men went forth in Galilee and were preaching, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John is recorded as preaching that in Matthew 3, 2. Jesus had the same message in Matthew 4 and verse 17. There was also a superstition that when departed spirits returned to a fleshly existence, they possessed supernatural powers. Now, of course, John did no miracle, as we read in John chapter 10 and verse 41. However, the news of Jesus' miracles had spread throughout the country. So he concluded that the spirit of John had returned and was being manifested in the one called Jesus. The fourth reason, as already mentioned, is the guilt, perhaps, that he felt for having given the order to kill John. Well, now we want to come to John's pronouncement in Matthew 14, 3 through 5. Prior to giving the order for John's death, Herod had imprisoned John, some believe at Machairus, a fortress east of the Dead Sea. He had done that because of his wife, Herodias, who was actually his brother Philip's wife. We'll get to that in just a moment. But John had told Herod, it is not lawful for you to have her. And uh, we're going to see why. But first of all, we kind of need a scorecard to tell who's who. Herodias was the granddaughter of Herod the Great, which makes her, since Herod is his son, which makes Herodias Herod's niece. And they were both married prior to the time we're reading about here in Matthew 14. She had originally been married to Herod's half-brother named Philip, not Philip the Tetrarch, who had one-fourth of the kingdom, but another Philip who was very quiet and not much spoken of. And uh, so she was married to his half-brother Philip. Now, 
Herod Antipas was also married to the daughter of Aretas, the king of part of Arabia. He divorced her, the daughter of Aretas, and persuaded Herodias to leave her husband Philip to be married to him, which thereupon made her queen. So this was an upward uh, move on her part, and uh, that's how it came to be that we have Herod and Herodias together at the time of John and Jesus. We do not know the occasion of John's condemnation of the new, quote, marriage. Had he been asked by the crowd to comment on it, or did he take it upon himself to approach the ruler and tell him that it was not lawful for him to have her? We don't know the occasion of it, but we do know what he said, and what he said is, it is not lawful for you to have her. Now, imagine how a ruler and his wife might take to such a pronouncement being made. To marry her was wrong on several levels. It was a crime against his brother, whose wife she was, and according to God, still was. It was a crime against Herod's wife for him to desert her for another woman. It was a sin against God to live in adultery with this woman, and, and that's what they were doing, living in adultery. And it was a crime of incest forbidden by the law of Moses. In Leviticus 18, 16, and Leviticus 20 and verse 21, you were not allowed to marry your niece. Uh, that was strictly forbidden. Now, Herod may not have had any respect for the law, and he may not have cared what the law said, but he surely knew that the people of the kingdom he was ruling did. And uh, he did not care. He did what he chose and wanted to do rather than what was right to do. J.W. McGarvey commented concerning John, no man is worthy to stand before the people and call them to repentance who can wink at sin in high places and show a truckling respect of persons. Now, uh, the word truckling, I don't think I've seen anywhere else. It's just not a word we use. What it means is to weakly submit. You wouldn't want somebody who was trying to tell people to repent of their sins to weakly submit to a ruler who violated the law openly. As events unfold, it seems that Herodias turned out to be even more offended by the pronouncement than Herod. At first, Herod did want to put John to death, as we had in the scripture reading. But he decided not to because the people regarded John as a prophet. And uh, so he had learned to live with that. Now let's go to Matthew 14, 6 through 11 to look at the occasion of John's death. But when Herod's birthday was celebrated, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Therefore he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. So she, having been prompted by her mother, uh, said, give me John the Baptist's head here on a platter. And the king was sorry, nevertheless, because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he commanded it to be given to her. So he sent and had John beheaded in prison, and his head was brought out on a platter and given to the girl, 
and she brought it to her mother. Many have speculated concerning the dance that it was the dance of the seven veils or that it was a belly dance of some kind. The text doesn't say, but it probably was not a waltz. It was probably not something that was very tame. It was probably something that was very lascivious in nature to elicit this kind of response from Herod. So he foolishly promised, even with an oath, to give her whatever she might want. Now, being under the authority of her mother, she asked her mother, and uh, the mother told her what to ask for, the head of John on a platter. It's doubtful that this would have been the daughter's first choice if she were left to her own devices. She probably would have liked gold or something a little more useful. But that's what her mother said, and that's what she said she wanted. Now, the king was sorry. Now, you might think, well, that's interesting that he was sorry when at one point he wanted John dead himself. Well, he did, but take a look at uh, Mark chapter uh, 6 and verse 20. Mark chapter 6 and verse 20 tells us, For Herod feared John, knowing he was a just and holy man. Now think about that. He knew that he was a just and holy man. And he protected him, and when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. So although his initial response was to want to kill him, he got over it. He realized John was a holy and a just man, and he went and uh, heard him speak uh, gladly. So his opinion, the better opinion, won out in his case, and he no longer wanted him dead, but not the case with Herodias. She did not relent as to her initial response. She wanted him dead, and she got what she wanted. So John was swiftly executed, mercifully, and his head was brought to the daughter who gave it to her mother. Now let's read uh, Matthew 14, 12 and 13. <clears throat> then the disciples came and took away the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. We don't know how John's body was treated after they removed his head. They may have tossed it in a field. They may have tossed it outside a, a city wall. We don't know, but his disciples buried him with the respect that he deserved. When Jesus was told, he tried to get away by himself, perhaps to grieve the loss of this godly man. But the needs of the people came first, and he found himself having to teach once again. Many people in the world back then and still today believe that results determine whether an action is right or wrong. That is not true. Results don't determine whether something is right or wrong. God does. It was right for John to tell the truth concerning Herod and Herodias. Jesus himself ended up being crucified for telling the truth about himself as he testified that he is the Son of God. This is what led to his death. So the results of telling the truth are not determined by what follows. We tell the truth because it's the right thing to do, because God wants us to do it, 
But many people think, oh, well, look at those bad results. They shouldn't have done that. No, they should have. What happened was not the fault of Jesus. The crucifixion was not his fault. It was the fault of evil men clamoring for it. The death of John was not because John said these words. They were truth. It was because of the evil that Herodias and Herod possessed. The guilty couple, Herod and Herodias, did not remain in power long. Herod's wife's father, Aretas, understood that Herod had put her away for another woman. He brought his army against him and soundly thrashed him. As a result of that, Herod fled to Rome where Caligula banished both him and Herodias to Gaul on a charge of misgovernment. On the day of judgment, John will fare better than his murderers. He will be welcomed into eternal life. They will be ushered into eternal condemnation. All of the results of a person's actions are not seen here on earth. God makes the final decision on that day. Now notice one other thing before we leave this passage. And that is that marriage is used in an accommodative sense. Let's go back to Mark chapter 6 and notice verse 17. For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Now wait a minute. She's his brother Philip's wife, but he married her. How is that possible? It's possible because the word is being used in an accommodative sense. Herodias was still Philip's wife as far as God was concerned. But he had married her according to our civil laws, or the civil laws of Rome. And that shows us that what people do according to civil law does not square with what God thinks about it. A person can decide he doesn't want his wife anymore and uh, file for divorce and get it in a civil court and then go marry some other woman. And uh, all of it is legal, but none of it pleases God. And so he is still married to his first wife. He may be married, quote, civilly to someone else, but God didn't recognize the divorce and he doesn't recognize the marriage. Now this will come in handy as we move our way toward Matthew 19, where Jesus is going to be asked a specific question on this topic. But we just need to realize that there are uh, accommodative senses in which words are used as well as in the literal sense. The question for each one of us is where do we stand and what will we have said and will we have compromised or not compromised on the day of judgment? When we stand before the judgment seat, uh, we want to have a clear conscience and have done what God has required us and commanded us to do. We don't want to be like those who compromised as Herod did. Yes, he had given an oath, but he could have said to all of those present, I gave my oath, but I don't know what I was doing. It is not right to, to kill an innocent, just, and holy man, which he knew John was. But no, he did not do that. John, on the other hand, refused to compromise. Maybe he could have sought some way around from making that pronouncement. If somebody had asked him, he might have said, well, it's not my job to tell rulers what to do. Or 
maybe he could have said, I, I'm not going to answer that. But no, he did answer it, and he answered it correctly. It is not lawful for you to have your brother Philip's wife. Are we among those who compromise or those who are uncompromising? We must stand with the truth because God ordains that we should. Speaking of truth, the Bible only gives one plan of salvation. We uh, will be, Lord willing, talking about this in class next Sunday morning. God has taken notice of the problem that man has with sin and the debt of sin that man owes. And he has a plan whereby that sin can be forgiven. And it involves Jesus. And it involves the blood of Christ washing away the sins of mankind. But wait, somebody says, well, how does that work? Because I've seen and read a whole bunch of different things. I know. And there are a whole bunch of different things that are just flat out false. I suggest that if you want to know what to do to be saved, you go to the book where God tells you what to do. And we have several instances where people were saved from their sins. They were sinners, but they pursued a certain course of action, and they were cleansed of their sins and made holy in God's sight. But now what many people do is they run over to Matthew and grab a scripture. They run over to Romans and grab some scriptures, and they run here and there, Everywhere except where it's described, which is in the book of Acts. And the very first time that it comes up is in Acts chapter 2. When Peter convinced the people that they had crucified the Son of God, but that he had been raised from the dead. And not only Peter, but all the apostles were witnesses of these things. And the people said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, if somebody comes up with a different answer other than what you read in the scriptures, there's something wrong because the gospel hasn't changed. God didn't give a gospel for the first century and a different one for the 21st century. He didn't give a gospel for men and a different one for women. He didn't have one for the Jews and another one for the Gentiles. The gospel is the one and the same gospel that there has been since this day of Pentecost. And so anybody who comes up with a different answer, you ought to treat as suspect. We go by what the scriptures teach. We're not going to compromise with what some men think. We're not going to compromise with what some theologians say. We're going to go by what the Bible says because that is inspired of God and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So what was said on the day of Pentecost? They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. Read along. Acts chapter 2. In verse 37, the question is asked, beginning in verse 38, Peter gives an answer. And here's what he says. <clears throat> in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Peter said to them, repent. Now, I'm going to stop there just for a second to point out that uh, yesterday I spent probably three hours answering this guy that wrote Pure Grace who's, who takes issue with repentance. How can you take issue with repentance? But he does. However, that's what Peter said. I don't care how many people say we don't need to repent. Peter said we do need to repent. He told that group of people, you need to repent. But that's not all he told them. Let's look at the rest of the verse. Repent and let every one of you 
be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They needed to repent. They also needed to be baptized in order to have their sins forgiven. Well, not only does some object to repentance, Almost everybody says, oh, no, you don't need to be baptized. I, yeah, you probably ought to do it, but you don't need to do it. Oh, where does that come from? They have a different gospel, apparently, not the one that Peter preached. Peter was clear, repent, and let every one of you be baptized. And then uh, another thing that is very popular among some people is... Uh, for them to say, oh, well, if you're baptized, then you worked. You earned salvation. How does such a passive act turn into a work? It's the working of God. And the other people say, oh, you can't do anything to save yourself. Well, let's keep reading. Peter says in verse 39, For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Or as the King James put it, Save yourselves from this generation. Yes, you do need to respond. Yes, there is something you need to do. When you do it, you're not earning salvation, but you have a response. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And by the way, in verse 41, we rejoice to read those who gladly received his word were baptized in the same day 3,000 souls were added to them. Yes, baptism is essential. And all you have to do is read what the Bible says. As you go through the book of Acts, you'll find that baptism is included in every account of conversion. And yet, it's the one thing people want to throw out. Why? Because their gospel is not the gospel of the New Testament. You can read it for yourself. We have the same gospel today that they had back then. We didn't make anything up. We didn't add anything to it. We didn't take anything away from it. We just read it and encourage people to do the same thing Peter said to do on that day of Pentecost. And if you have never been baptized in order to have your sins forgiven, we invite you to do so today. Don't compromise. Don't say, well, uh, 70 people said this, so they're the majority. No, we don't go by majority. We go by the truth. John was uncompromising. How about you? If we can help you obey the gospel this morning, let us know if you need to return to the love of the truth that you once had. Come now while we stand and while we sing. Trust.
trust and obey, but we never can prove the delights of His love until all on the altar we lay for the favor He shows and the joy He bestows are for those who will trust and obey. Trust and obey for there's no We'll sing hymn number 298. 298, There Stands a Rock. We'll sing the first and last verse. Uh, as we stated in our announcements, uh, we see we have a few.